Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be on this conference. Glad you can join in. I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, about my own personal journey with kidney disease and how exercise was able to help me manage it. And Kristen, in her second part, will be the more on a clinician side telling you how to manage your own exercise routine, perhaps with your own condition. And so moving on to the first slide, I'm going to start with a little bit of my childhood. I have to admit that I, I grew up with a, a normal and seemingly healthy childhood. I had no idea that something was cooking within that I had underlying health condition. I uh, really had no symptoms to speak of. I didn't really engage any risky behavior. Everything was, was normal from my point of view. I had really no allergies, so really nothing to complain about. So as I moved on in my life, over to the next slide if possible. By this year, I was a university student in my early 20s and I found myself a summer job and I was actually working in the hospital and as part of the requirements of working in this hospital I had to go through a medical checkup, a regular med medical checkup. So I wasn't really expecting anything out of the ordinary so everything came off pretty well except for one little thing. The um, test showed there were traces of blood and protein in my urine. So if you, maybe you could just stick on to the next uh, previous slide, thanks. So uh, as I was saying, there was blood and protein in my urine. So I was told to further investigate this, see what would happen. Uh, I was, and I ended up seeing my general practitioner, my, my personal doctor who ended up sending me to several doctors, ended up sending me to a plethora of different tests. And finally I was referred to a nephrologist and I was given a surprise diagnosis really to me that I was diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. And my first reaction was, it doesn't really make any sense. It doesn't really register with me um, to the point where is that it was quite, deceiving and perplexing to kind of look at myself in the mirror to think that I had kidney disease when the fact that nothing really showed physically. I was down to already 33% of kidney function. My initial diagnosis was FSGS, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Nothing seemed to indicate that I had any family history in it. So it was really out of the blue. And I really had no idea that this was gonna be such a, a life-changing diagnosis. Little did I know that further on, it was going to be anyway. And so what I did was I just, um, I kept on living my life at this point. If we can move on to the next slide, just moving on to the next slide. So I was shown the classic symptoms of kidney disease. A lot of you might relate to it from the puffy cheeks. This is actually a famous Hollywood actress um, started in a sitcom not too long ago. And on the screen on the right, on the picture on the right was someone with swollen feet. I really didn't manifest these symptoms at all. It was really all foreign to me, just really, knowing that something inside was wrong, but like seemingly in front, it didn't seem real to me at the time. So really what I did was I just kept on living my life. I just decided to soldier on. Moving on to the next slide, if possible. I, by this point, I finished my university studies. I graduated with a degree in kinesiology. I moved to California, it was my dream to uh, not necessarily just move to California, but work in my passion, which was tennis at the time. I ended up working as a full-time tennis coach in the tennis academy. This was quite the um, very demanding lifestyle where I was under the hot California sun for eight hours a day, teaching uh, to seven days a week, pretty much for a good part of the year. And I, I loved it. Little did I know that kidney disease was starting, slowly starting to creep up in terms of how I started feeling. Some of the symptoms I started feeling were fatigue. Uh, my blood pressure started going up. And just overall, maybe I just maybe started feeling a little bit different, but I just, carried on my routine as normally as I could. And this, this lasted me for about two years. So if I move on to the next slide, um, by this time in 2009, my kidney function was down to 10%. And I was really badly manifesting my symptoms to the point where I just really had a hard time managing my own daily routine in life. I had a hard time keeping with that lifestyle. My symptoms started becoming more apparent, really, uh, really, I guess it was the swelling of my limbs. And just more of all mood, along with the energy, just started sagging. I just really didn't feel like myself. And a lot of, as a result, a lot of raw, a lot of raw emotions started coming out. And so it was decided that between my nephrologist who was following me up in California, as well as my nephrologist in Canada, here in Montreal, they both decided that it was time for me to either go to dialysis have a, or have a kidney transplant. So what ended up happening was, this is a picture of me and my brother. My brother's on the right. My brother ended up being worked up to be a potential organ donor. For, uh, for kidney. And so on November 19th of this year, of that year, rather, he gave me a kidney. And so this was quite a momentous event for me, just personally, just my whole life got turned upside down, just from really living with the symptoms of kidney disease to all of a sudden having a, a foreign object, especially your brothers, 
was uh, quite jarring in the beginning, but it took it took a little bit of getting used to. Now, what happened was um, as they as they follow you up, if we kind of can move on to the next slide, just really quickly, right, let's stay right here for a little bit. For those who may have had a transplant, well, what happens is that they can really keep a close eye on you in the first couple of days. Really, the first critical day, first couple of days are really critical. So in terms of they monitor you with a whole bunch of blood tests, along with a lot of kidney biopsies, and as well as ultrasounds, just to make sure your kidney's functioning well, your transplanted kidney. But there was just one little problem. My creatinine levels were stabilizing, but they weren't going any lower. And in fact, they were starting to go up. They were just start, slowly started to increase, which was not normal. And so it came along with more blood tests, more ultrasounds, more biopsies. And if you can just press enter, uh, Kristen, at the line. So what ended, what ended up starting as acute rejection of my kidney ended up becoming chronic rejection. So I was sadly given the news by my nephrologist and a team of doctors that this kidney from my brother, from who apparently were supposed to be compatible, was not going to last. And there was no, really no telling when this kidney was going, to, uh, was going to endure. And so it was quite devastating news for me in the beginning. You know, just when I thought I was on the top of the world, but then getting this devastating news was was quite uh, was quite difficult to take. So what I decided to do was I still decided to make the most of it. Um, in terms of exercise, I really really wasn't giving any term uh, sort of reference to my doctors of what can be done, what it can't be done. In terms of resources, there weren't really that many at the time either. So I just pretty much listened to my own body made use of my own background and experience and just really winged it in terms of what I can possibly what I can possibly do with a rejected transplanted kidney. And in fact, I was able to accomplish a lot. So luckily for me, what I, I found uh, an ad in my hospital on the transplant unit, a wall advertising for what's called the Canadian Transplant Games, which is an organ donation event, which reunites all healthy organ transplant recipients to really promote the cause of organ donation, but really to celebrate our second chance of life. And so these were my first transplant games, Quebec City. Tennis was obviously my sport. I stuck with that. The year afterwards, I participated in what's called the World Transplant Game. So these are kind of the Olympics of, of, of transplantees. So pretty much it's the same scale, but more globally. So you travel in different parts of the world, takes place every two years in a different country, different city. And here I am holding a Canadian flag representing my, my country. So it was quite a thrill. It was my first time. Got to meet with a whole bunch of other people, really get to experience the spirits and just really stories of survival. And really they were quite inspiring for myself. If we can move on to the next slide. Yet I was faced with a, a cruel reality, meaning that I couldn't really delay the inevitable that this, this kidney of my brother's was eventually failing on me. So by this point, I had it for about a year and a half and it chronically, well, it got to the point where my creatinine levels started rising again. And so what happened was I was back to square one. Really, I was given the choice of either dialysis or transplant, but this time around, I didn't have a, a family member ready and willing to give me a transplant. So I pretty much had to do dialysis. So dialysis looked like this for me. I ended up choosing peritoneal dialysis for several reasons. I felt I was still young enough and independent to learn how to do this on my own. I got to do this at home instead of going to the hospital three or four times a week. Also, I wanted to maintain some sort of lifestyle where I was working on a part-time basis at the time. So my life pretty much depended on this machine where basically I drained this fluid inside my belly through the catheter and the, and the fluid from the catheter flows out into the machine. At first, it's manual exchanges that I learned to do, but then eventually the cycler takes over. So this machine is, you kind of sleep with it for nine hours out of your whole day. So it pretty much drastically alters your daily routine, not to mention your lifestyle, your need to adapt to the schedule. But it was really two of the most difficult years of my life in terms of quality of life. I wasn't really able to have the same type of energy to be as active as I wanted to be. And gradually, well, along with, with the, the side effects of, of, of kidney disease, well, the side effects of peritoneal dialysis, I probably landed myself in the hospital maybe about five, six times a year to the emergency room for various problems, such as infections or my blood pressure was getting too high or mechanical issues. My, sometimes my catheter just came off, ripped off by accident, which would have led to maybe a possible infection to just overall, just not really feeling great. And this was quite a, quite a difficult time, just not just for myself, but for my family. And so it was just a matter of, for me, surviving 
um, as, as best as I could, despite me being young and despite being active and vibrant. Well, I have to admit that kidney disease was really, really running my life at this point. So just to give you an idea of what I experienced physically, I think this is kind of the most jarring thing of I, I can kind of show for you myself, but just also as a reminder for myself of what peritoneal dialysis looked. So the picture on the left was year one. Uh, my, you notice my foot in my right might have looked a bit more swollen than my left, but then over to the picture on the right, year two, both my feet, well, they pretty much swelled up pretty big to the point where no matter how many foot pumps I would have been able to do or cycling, um, kidney disease and dialysis were just not really cooperating with me. And, it's, and so I was left with dealing with this type of, uh, of symptom, which is quite difficult along with the pain, along with the high blood pressure and the sagging energy levels and just mood kills really that, um, that made just life overall very difficult and, and hard to get by. And so what happened for me was, well, I, I lucked out. I, I really have to thank my lucky stars. I just feel extremely blessed and just grateful to be even be in this position right now to be speaking to you because I got a second transplant on January 19th of 2014. This time I have to say that my daughter was cadaveric, who I found out later uh, to turn out to be a young woman who tragically passed away. And her, the mother decided to write me a letter a year later to uh, let me know of, of the whereabouts of, of what happened, but also just to check up on us recipients, lucky recipients to have gained her organs. And so it was, it, was just, it was just such an emotional time, a lot of emotional upheaval, a lot of maybe feelings of guilt at the same time, whether I was deserving or whether I waited enough for a second transplant, but it just, I guess it just happened to be my turn. Wasn't to say that it was it was smooth sailing after second transplant. Um, there was a lot of complications. It was a three week hospitalization, and so to graph below, well, just to give you an idea of what healing kind of looks like for maybe a lot of us. So sometimes we would expect to heal in a more linear fashion. We see the dotted line; it goes straight up, <laughs> and it doesn't it doesn't really stray. It eventually reaches its peak, but in reality, kind of you kind of look at the the curvy lines. It does lots of ups and downs, lots of setbacks, lots of um, maybe more bad times and good times, but eventually, hopefully, it does stable off at the end, and you're able to kind of function normally back to how you normally felt. And so, this was my sort of my journey. So, I gave myself a goal, not to say that I mean, don't be misled that I went from the hospital straight from the hospital bed to this point here, but it was really a slow and gradual and progressive return to to training. So, what started off for me was maybe slow walking from from my hospital room, maybe down the hallway to eventually picking up the pace, to eventually maybe starting to lift up small weights, to eventually being able to gradually resume what I was able, what I was normally able to do beforehand. And that's not to say that this pr process happens overnight, but it takes a lot of steps. And certainly I wasn't able to do this on my own, but I was determined that with, with this newfound new lease of life for the second time, that I was going to make something out of this. I was going to maximize whatever I had and and make the most of it. And sure enough, I did. So this was six months uh, to, my, to the day of my second transplant. I was back in a tennis court, back in the Canadian transplant games, playing my favorite thing. I actually lost this tennis match to another kidney transplant recipient. So I was a little bit down naturally. I was a little bit just maybe just hard on myself, but I was re reminded by my fellow transplant recipients who were there attending and some of my friends and maybe also the families as well that I, I made it to six months post transplant of my second trans of my second kidney and I made it back on a tennis court. So this was definitely something to, to highlight, to rejoice. It was definitely a journey to, to get work to where I was. But if I go on to the next slide, even better, a year later, I went back to the World Transplant Games once again, the worldwide event. I traveled to Argentina, it was my first time going down there to South America with my parents, represented Canada. This time I won a bronze medal. I really couldn't be active, uh, couldn't be, really be happier with what, I, what I've accomplished. I was beyond over the moon, I was just thrilled. And it really, I mean, it just goes to show that you just never really know what you can achieve until you really, you really push yourself and test yourself out there. At least that was the mindset that I approached it with. And so if I were to leave you with maybe a few lessons and reflections of my own personal journey, First of all, let's start off with chronic kidney disease. Well, their effects are wide ranging, as you know. I mean, as yourself, the individual, for the person, yourself, as well as your support unit. So I'm really talking about your family, your loved ones, really every, anyone who is supporting you down the road or on, on the side. Um, kidney disease, really, it's, it's not just 
an ind individual really aspect, but it's really something I think should be shared with others. No matter how, what stage of kidney disease you're at, I think it's really important that you recognize this and that however you feel will also impact how they feel. And in turn, whatever they feel will also impact how you feel. But it's not to say that this is something that you should you know, keep to yourself, but really something that's, that's shared. From denial to accepting a new, new normal, as maybe I mentioned earlier in my presentation, I went through the whole gamut of emotions, really, from really not believing that I was sick to maybe being angry, to grieving a little bit, thinking that my life was gonna be over, thinking that I wasn't able to, I wasn't gonna be able to go back to the things I love doing and go back to work and being a valuable member of society to maybe accepting that, hey, I can actually live with this after all. It's a new normal for me. I can deal with it. If not, well, I'm gonna use the resources that I, that I can possibly have. And it's a process really. I think it's, it's a process for everyone. But it's, I think it's really important to take that time to really recognize each aspect of the emotions and really sink in and, and not being afraid to emote. And the third point was, what good can come out of this? Seeing the glass half empty versus the glass half full. Now I admit that um, as in the beginning, I'm, I was more of a pessimistic type of person. Maybe sometimes I am just out of habit or sometimes I would just really see the, the negative of a lot of things. And it really took me a while to really cultivate just a new way of thinking, just to think of you know, what good can come out of this. I know that kidney disease can sometimes be really daunting and exhausting for a lot of people, including myself. But at, at the same time, I think that if you, you can recognize maybe the good parts of it sometimes, even those small little things, it can maybe make a difference down the long run. I know it certainly helped me and I certainly enjoyed better outcomes when I changed that little mindset of mind to thinking that well, it's not all that half bad. Maybe there's a little bit, there's maybe a silver lining and down the road and maybe there was, and it turns out it was for me. Taking stock of your own resources, your abilities, really taking stock of your assets. Really, I think we tend to undermine what tools that we have in our possession at the moment. So let's say if I'm sick with kidney disease, well, at least I had a loving family that has supported me. I had a great staff at the hospital that, that took really good care of me. I maybe had a good view of out of my hospital room a couple of times, maybe little things once again, to just remind you that there are things at your disposal that can help you get through a lot of, a lot of the emotional stuff or it's just as much as the physical stuff. And really to remind yourself that there are, there are good tools that are around for you, if not within yourself, maybe around you. Establishing the value of goals, establishing your whys. I think it was really key for me to have that mindset to really give myself a goal of, all right, once I get my transplant, I don't really want to go back to just living my life as best as I possibly could with whatever means I have, with whatever physical abilities I can. Just taking advantage of really my second chance and really just paying it forward just due to my, my donor and really establishing my whys in terms of my emotions. I mean, this is really emotional. It's really personal for everyone, but why is it? What gets you up out of, out of bed in the morning? Why is it you wanted to go to the transplant games? Why is it you go take care and... Take, um, take all those meds uh, in, for, in order for you to keep yourself healthy. I think um, it's not just because the doctor told you, but I think you need to have that really important why within yourself. I, had to, I really had to let go of my ego, let go of, of keeping things within myself. I was really someone who was, who was uh, should I say, really um, introverted. I didn't really like to share with a lot of things, but gradually I felt like I had to open up. It was really a cathartic at the same time. It really, uh, really relieved a lot of tensions off my shoulders. And really there's, there's a lot more resources out there, more and more, including the one we have today on exercise. And I'm sure you're enjoying the other topics. Don't be afraid to use them. And finally, to celebrate the wins, acknowledge the fears and setbacks. Just think that life like kidney disease or any type of illness is a journey. So accepting the good and the bad, and maybe down the road, well, eventually the good will outweigh the bad at some point, but I'll never forget the times when I was definitely sick. And I definitely don't take for granted for now the times where I'm healthy. And so as I leave you with my last slide before handing the reins over to Kristen, I'd like to leave you with this, something that served me a lot in my recovery and I hope maybe in life too as well, maybe something maybe you can think of as well that results happen over time, not overnight. Work hard, stay consistent, consistent and be patient with whatever it is. Just really believe in yourself. And just to let you know that if you clicked on one more time, Kristen, that no matter what age, no matter what condition you're at, it's never too late to start. It just really just to get started, just to get motivated, just to just to take that first step. And if you need help, well, it's always around the corner. So that pretty much wraps it up for me. Uh, Kristen's now going to take over and uh, take it away, Kristen. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lloyd, for that wonderful presentation. Can everyone hear me okay? You guys can hear me, Lloyd? Someone yes. thumbs up? Okay. Yes. All right, I'm going to... I'm going to jump right into it because um, I want to give you guys the tips and tricks and simple little resources you can take away. So have a pen and paper handy because I'm going to go through a lot of this pretty fast. But I mean, this is the golden age of information. I don't need to tell you that exercise works. We know the benefits. I'm not going to get into that. Um, but I want to make you guys more empowered today. Now, I had a wonderful nephrologist I worked with for many years, Dr. Hans out here in Calgary. And he always used to say, physicians are not magicians. And I love that quote because it really puts the ownership on you guys for, for how well you're going to live with your kidney journey, your kidney disease situation. And I, when I talk about exercise, I talk to my patients over the years and I've said, uh, well, you know, this is the stuff we want to try doing little bits and bobs here and there. And people will tell me, well, that sounds like a lot of work. And I would suggest that you are going to have to work either way. Either you work a little now and it's easier later, or you don't work now, fine, sit around, don't, you know, do what these little tasks are, are really going to help you with. And you're going to challenge, be challenged a lot more later in life. And I've seen that over the 12 years I've worked in, he, in, in uh, hemodialysis units. Remember too, that you are worth the work. Okay. That's really important. Now there's a lot of mindset shifting these days. And I've been on a lot of podcasts and a lot of what people are talking about is just shifting from sick care to healthcare, okay? And the five pillars that all our anti-aging experts and uh, functional medicine doctors and wellness experts are talking about now uh, are A, get moving, get some sort of activity. Even if you don't love the word exercise, you don't like formal exercise, still physical activity, get moving. For every 30 minutes of sitting, you need to be up moving around for five minutes or do some stretching, do some standing balance, anything. Because sitting is the new smoking, uh, according to experts as well. Sleep hygiene. Uh, how many people have been hearing lately about how important sleep is, especially during this pandemic? We learn about how we can build up our immune system. One of the best things is to get good sleep. And if you're not a good sleeper, there are incredible resources online. Study uh, Dr. Dr. Matthew Walker has a wonderful TED talk on sleep hygiene. He's a world expert on the topic. Uh, I can't stress enough about letting food be thy medicine. Talk to a renal dietitian, get some clean nutrition tips going. I always tell my patients, if your grandparents wouldn't recognize what you're eating, then you're probably eating processed junk. So really keep it clean. Stress what? management is important. Oh, and sorry, someone mute there. Uh, stress management is really important. UCLA and Harvard are now dedicating research departments to meditation and what that does for the mind and the brain and the whole body for that matter. Uh, we have a lot of depression and anxiety situations, especially more than ever with the pandemic. So it's amazing. I, I love the Insight Timer app. It's a great little app you can download on your phone. Again, Insight Timer, 80,000 free meditations and they're all grouped by different uh, benefits. You know, if you want sleep, there's your categorized uh, categories for sleep meditation. There's ones for mood and uh, depression, anxiety, you name it. And then I won't touch on purpose too much because Lloyd has told us his amazing shift in his life purpose and having support structures around you, good friends, good family. It's incredibly important these days. So overall, it's about quality of life. And I try to meet my patients where they're at. Not everyone loves to do big amounts of exercise. Lloyd's an exception. A lot of people, it's just those little, little tips and tricks that throughout the day we want to get them moving on. So when I meet my patients, I always tell them, this is what I do. Here's, here's what I can support you with. And they go, oh, Kristen, I'm good. I walk. I say, well, that's great. Keep walking. However, you're missing out on other components of fitness that are incredible, really important for quality of life. Uh, the must, the must have in your repertoire is to maintain or build muscle. So if you can do strength training with your body weight, therabands, soup cans, little dumbbells, whatever you can do in your home, or if you do want to get out into like a community class one day when those kind of things are available again, there's a lot of virtual online stuff. Please, please, please maintain that muscle. That's one of the most important factors in healthy aging. 
cardio, we do know that 30 minutes a day is ideal. Obviously, not everyone feels up for it, especially with kidney disease. If you can break it up into little, little snippets, you know, five minutes here, 10 minutes there, it's helping to get the blood flow to the feet, especially if you're diabetic, we want to keep the blood flow to those feet. I get people to try some pandemic isolation dancing in the kitchen, put on some music, dance a little bit. It's wonderful. It boosts the mood. It helps your balance. Stretching, that's one of the things that you can do when you're exhausted. One of the best things I tell my patients to do, if they don't feel well, they're tired, you can still stretch and benefit your muscles. When you have more limber body uh, mechanics, you're not gonna have the joint pain, you're gonna have better mobility. A lot of people don't stretch long enough too. So 30 seconds is what I recommend to lengthen the muscle. And you know, most people will only stretch for five to 10 seconds per stretch. And I don't think that's enough. So really lengthen the muscle beautifully, you'll feel a lot better. And then balance training, something you can do in the kitchen when you're waiting for the kettle to boil or the microwave to finish, you know, reheating something, you can stand in the kitchen, you can have the countertop right there, work on balance. There's some great resources I'm going to share with you some balance training tips that you can start to implement. And uh, I do them every day. I'm 45 and I'm already doing my balance training. I love my yoga. I think that's really great. I mean, if I slip outside on the ice, I can catch myself. I got better, better uh, proprioception. My brain, my muscle connection is much more enhanced. Now I will say, make sure you do discuss starting a program or any kind of exercise with your doctor. And if you are currently exercising, great, then just implement hopefully some of these ideas that I'm showing you today. Now, also inquire about your bone health. When you talk with your doctor, find out kind of if you are on the more of the higher risk for bone fractures. People on, with kidney disease, especially my hemodialysis patients, do have some level of osteoporosis for the most part. So if you do have uh, severe osteoporosis, you know, we are going to avoid any uh, rotation of the spine or any forward flexion, any bending where you're really bent forward. So when you tie your shoes or put your, your shoes on, you'd maybe want to sit in a chair and pop your foot up on a bench or something. Uh, keep your bones, keep your spine safe. Now I'm going to touch on all the different kidney disease stages because we got people from all across Canada on all different levels in their kidney journey. So right now I'm going to touch, touch on uh, stage three and four. So anything less than 60% GFR or kidney function and anything above 15%. Uh, the biggest thing at this group is prevention. Prevention is key. And now in the last seven years, we've had some wonderful studies come out. There was a 10 year study. They found that the, the one group that did aquatic exercise for 10 years had none of them needing to start dialysis in 10 years. The group that was sedentary, they followed them for 10 years and over half of them had to start dialysis or had sadly passed away. There's a Brazil study and a UK study that said they found in the exercise group, there was a trend towards improved renal function. And a big meta-analysis was just recently done a, a year and a half ago. In meta-analysis, they, they kind of summarize a ton of studies. And this group concluded that exercise does help improve kidney function. Mainly, I think what's happening is if you're, especially if you're diabetic or have high blood pressure, you can use lifestyle choices to manage the disease that's causing a lot of the, the kidney failure. So this is a really important empowerment for you. Now, if you're below 15% kidney function, if you've started to enter into stage five, obviously keep active as much as you can, but monitor for symptoms. If you're short of breath, if you are feeling nauseous, you get in some of those uremic symptoms, then you, you're gonna have to tone things back a bit. Do stay in close contact with your nephrologist. Dialysis patients. Now we got hemodialysis and we got peritoneal dialysis. I'm going to break those two up. So if you're on hemodialysis in Canada right now, there are wonderful intradialytic exercise programs in Winnipeg, Calgary, Edmonton. I know a lot of nurses have been leading these kind of programs and they're sprinkled throughout the country. We know it's time well wasted, time well spent. I like to joke about that. It's safe. It's monitored Why? while you're on dialysis. We can monitor your blood pressures. We can have, um, you know, basically it's a one-stop shop. You're sitting there. We're going to get better toxin removal because when people are pedaling on these little bikes during dialysis, we're improving blood flow to the leg muscles. And that is going to remove those trapped toxins, make your dialysis better. I have patients over the years who've commented on improved stamina. They got better leg strength. Their energy is better. I find that the little bit of energy they get from the biking on dialysis helps them do more on their non-dialysis days. 
The symptom management is also another added bonus. So people who get restless legs have problems with sleep or knee pain or any kind of pain for that matter. They, they've all commented over the years that their, uh, their biking has helped them immensely. Peritoneal dialysis is one of those groups that haven't had a lot of exercise resources or research over the years, but it is growing. Now, aside from the initial six weeks after a catheter is inserted, you know, doctors would say don't lift anything more than 10 pounds. But after that, there really wasn't a lot to go on. And, and Lloyd was a, you know, he was telling his story about how there was nothing out there for information on what to do. So, you know, things have changed. Now, we, are, we now know that a little bit of exercise, gradual and progressive, as long as it's gradual, is excellent. And we want people to focus on core stability. So the transverse abdominal muscles that support that peritoneal fluid will really help also support your low back. So people who have peritoneal fluid in their abdomen for several hours a day, it can put a strain on the low back. If you have a strong core muscle wall to support that, that PD fluid, you're going to do much better. We also find that proper breathing, if you're doing activities, or even if you're having a bowel movement and you're grunting, that puts a lot of intra-abdominal pressure on your core. And so there's risk for PD catheter leaks or hernias if you have that intra-abdominal pressure. So making sure you're breathing through all your activities when you're going to lift a box or anything, make sure it's close to your body and you're using you know, proper mechanics and breathing properly. Uh, the Grex team, this is our group of researchers and experts from all around the world we've formed. It's called the Global Renal Exercise Group. We are creating recommendations right now. We're in the final draft and we will be publishing these or sending them out soon. And we'll have answers to all the big questions for PD, whether we go dry, what do we do with swimming? What do we do with sports? What about sex? And so you'll have a lot of those answers coming up very soon. For the most part, as long as it's gradual and progressive, absolutely do it and listen to your body. Paul Bennett also just did a feasibility study and they found absolutely super safe to do no problem at all. Now out in Calgary and I think around Canada, we're starting to gain traction on this term prehabilitation. So if you are in the transplant workup, if you've got a living donor or you're at the top of the transplant list for a cadaver transplant, then we want you as fit as possible going into that transplant. Now we call it training for transplant. It's like training you for an, uh, an Olympics or whatever, a big sport competition. When we are exercising before transplant, people seem to seem to be a little more motivated. Uh, they would be trying to lose a little weight if they need to reach uh, some of the recommendations for the body mass index. We found that there was less rehab needed after transplant if they're fitter going into the, the surgery. And a uh, uh, study out of Baltimore, Maryland said that there was a shorter hospital stay. So that's great news. Now, after transplant, out in Calgary, we're very lucky to have a kinesiologist that works in the hospital with the transplant patients, and she goes and visits them after. They do have lifting restrictions for six weeks after the, the transplant, but they get them up walking. Walking is great. Within a day of the transplant, we get these people walking. Now, after when the patient goes home, Teresa, the kinesiologist, has got them doing some ankle pumps, knee extensions, sit to stands, just basic body weight exercises they can do at home as long as there's no pain and the blood pressure is under control. She'll give them a TheraBand and refer them to the Osteoporosis Canada website for the, the Too Fit to Fracture exercise resource. And that's a great one to look at. If you guys are at anyone, anyone it can write that down and go have a look at that. That's great for any stage in the kidney journey. And there's also the Can Restore group. They are uh, the Canadian team that encourages exercise for people with transplant. You can follow them on Twitter at Can Restore. And there's our famous goalie who got his kidney and then became the star last year. Was it last year? A couple of years ago when he had to be the emergency goalie. Now, if transplant isn't in your future, then and you're on dialysis, you know, chronic dialysis for the rest of your life, then it is about quality of life. My role out here in Calgary is also to help people maintain their function, stay independent in their homes, prevent falls, keep the legs strong. That's really one of my most important uh, areas of my job. Now, when people have medical setbacks, we want to climb our way back. Because what happens is people will have this long tra trajectory here with the, uh, the baseline function. And then let's say they have a fall. 
Then what happens is they accept this new function, this new baseline as their, their new normal. And I don't want them to do that. I want them to climb their way back, okay? Because otherwise it becomes a downward spiral and we want them to just climb their way back. Keep, keep fighting it, okay? It doesn't have to be a lot. It can be something as simple as a chair squat, up and downs from a chair. If you don't love moving, if you're tired, you're exhausted, but you can muster up 30 seconds a day to do this, you are gonna have a lot stronger muscles in your legs. You'll rehab after those darn hospital visits and prevent falls, really important. I have a couple success stories I wanna share with you. Uh, Ravi is a PD patient. He had low back pain in that first year of PD. And I think it was because the fluid was putting a lot of strain on his low back. And so we worked on those transverse ab contractions and it really focused on core health. And he did so much better. His back pain went away and he started feeling really good. I have quite a variety of patients. You can, you can see through this slide alone how, how varied my population is. I got a strongman competitor. His lifting goal is a 700 pound deadlift. That's what he wants to be able to do. Now, his first question, one of the first questions he asked me was, when can I start pushing a car? And I said, well, let's make this gradual and progressive. What about starting with pushing a lawnmower or a golf cart first? You know, it was quite an interesting conversation, <laughs> but he's doing very well. Jim is a chronic hemodialysis client of mine. He's been on dialysis now for uh, 12 years. He had 26% lung function. He's on continuous oxygen. He bikes for 90 minutes, most dialysis runs he's ever had. I don't think there's maybe, maybe a few runs he's never biked, but he bikes almost every single run. He just told me today that he's actually been told he's now up to 37% lung function, which is remarkable because I, we didn't think he was going to ever improve. He's done amazing. He's an inspiration. Derek is a gentleman who's doing transplant workup. He had a heart attack, but he went through his cardiac rehab. He's doing interdialytic exercise. That's what this means here. He's doing our exercise, our virtual exercise class via Zoom, and he's losing weight for his transplant. And then this gentleman here, Jeff, he was a transplant recipient, but he wasn't able to get on the transplant list until he lost weight. He lost a hundred pounds, got on the transplant list. He was biking during dialysis. He was weight training at the gym. I gave him a full strength program. That's what he wanted. That was his stuff. And I am happy to help him with that and clean eating. And then he got his kidney in uh, December of 2019. He's done excellent. So here's some of the resources for you guys. I want you to get your pen and paper out. Uh, Google Grex or check out this global, global renal exercise group. Okay. You can also follow them on uh, Grexercise or follow us on Grexercise uh, on Twitter. And this is going to be the new resource. We're going to be in touch with kidney foundations all around the world. This is not just for patients, but for practitioners. So if you've got people, uh, nurses, doctors, people in your community that you're working with that are supporting you, have them join this group. We have webinars, we have information, we have current research, everything. We have resources for people all around the world with kidney disease. Sorry One to cut in, Kristen. Uh, we have maybe about, uh, about uh, two minutes left. Um, yep. I've got it. I've got it. Yeah, thank you. We've got well, this great resource here uh, through the Global Renal Exercise Group. It's the Get Active Guide. And this is created. This is where you guys would go. I don't go into a lot of detail here, but this is where you get the detail. It's created by the UK people. So check out the Get Active Guide. These are wonderful resources. Kidneyhealth.ca is out of Winnipeg. They've got great videos. You can look at their balance video, their stretching video, their strength video, and I think they have a cardio video. Bob Thank and Brad, you. the YouTube, sorry. sorry, the YouTube guys here, these guys are the physios out of Minneapolis. If you've got aches or pains during the pandemic, these guys have had another million followers because they are so good. So you can search Bob and Brad back pain, Bob and Brad knee pain. You'll get all sorts of great information from them. There's a couple great apps, Kidney Beam. They are a paid app, but they teach exercise classes specific for kidney patients. And then the Diamond Dallas Page Yoga Rebuild Program has got bed yoga, chair yoga, and standing yoga. This is taught by a 65-year-old wrestler, and it is hilarious. And my mom and I do that together, and her balance has improved. She's 69. She's just lost 14 pounds. So there's some really cool resources in there. I hope this has been helpful, and I'll just leave this off here with a final quote for you guys, and I'll pass it over to our moderators for any questions. Thank you.